Welcome to the webinar on taking your ideas to market. In this webinar, you will learn some of the key skills you'll need and the steps to take in order to take your idea to the market. In fact, most businesses start with an idea that took shape in someone's mind and made its way to the market. One of the key things to consider in the process is how to protect your idea, either by keeping it secret or through formal protection with intellectual property rights like trademark, patent, industrial design, or copyright. Because without protection, there is very little you can do to stop anyone from copying your idea. This webinar is co-presented by the Canadian Intellectual Property Office, CEPO, and the Intellectual Property Institute of Canada, EPIC. We can help you with intellectual property. I'm Lisa Desjardins, and I work at CEPO to increase the awareness and effective use of intellectual property by Canadians. CEPO is Canada's IP office, and we administer Canadian patents, registered trademarks, industrial designs, and copyrights. We're also part of systems that can be used to protect these abroad. When someone applies for these rights, they often rely on the help of an IP professional, such as a patent or trademark agent. IP professionals assist their clients in developing strategies and growing their businesses by protecting their IP rights in Canada and elsewhere. Whether you are considering a go-to market plan for a new product, taking your brand global or acquiring another business, IP professionals can help, particularly if you consult with them early in the process. The Intellectual Property Institute of Canada EPIC is the professional association and voice of intellectual property professionals. So we're fortunate to be joined by Louis-Pierre Gravel, who is the vice president of EPIC's board of directors and also a lawyer and registered patent agent in Montreal. Welcome to this webinar, Louis-Pierre. Thank you very much, Lisa. And I'm delighted to be here uh, presenting on World IP Day, and I look forward to this presentation. Thank you. So let's take a look at the topics we'll cover in this webinar. Taking your idea to the market involves many steps and it can be difficult to know where to begin. So we've divided this webinar into three segments. First, we'll look at some of the homework you'll need to do to investigate if you can take your idea to the market. Secondly, many successful businesses are also based on working with others to reach the market and to achieve their business goals. So being able to define what IP you own and what other people can do with it are important ways to maintain control over the exclusive rights that you have to your IP. So we'll look at how IP is dealt with in the typical contractual arrangements to partner, license, or sell your IP. Finally, taking on an idea to the market means that you'll need to wear many thinking hats. So we'll take a look at some of the key skills needed to take an idea to the market. And of course, we'll provide you with links to useful tools and organizations that can help you in your journey. Let's take a moment to think about protecting ideas. Think about the many forms of intellectual property that can be commercialized. For example, a trademark. This is the way that you can distinguish your goods and certain services from others in the marketplace. It can be a combination of letters, words, sounds, or designs. And it is important to a company because over time, this builds your company's reputation and brand. Or maybe you've invented something new, useful, and non-obvious. A patent is a legal right to prevent others from making, using, or selling your invention for up to 20 years. Or maybe you have some creative works. Then the good news is that Canada and many other countries, you are automatically the holder of the copyrights to that work. If you have distinctive and attractive features to give your products uh, a competitive edge, then you can have those features protected through an industrial design. There are also plant breeders' rights to protect new varieties of plants. And of course, you can commercialize other intellectual properties, such as trade secrets, your know-how, and other forms of IP that isn't registered. Again, if this feels a little bit overwhelming to you, Open the full description to this video. Here you'll find links to e-learning modules and a simple inventory to help you identify your IP assets. Louis Pierre, you're an IP professional and you're well immersed in both matters of the law and how to protect inventions and creations. Why is it important to identify and protect your IP? 
Well, I, I think the first point is that, you know, businesses spend a lot of time and effort trying to innovate. And we've been hearing a lot more about innovation and the knowledge economy over the past few years. And so the reality is that um, the, if you do not have protection, um, then you can't stop anyone else from doing what it is that you've innovated or invented or, or designed. Um, and so the, this basic fundamental aspect is that it's important to identify what you have in order to be able to then assert it if it needs be. And, and admittedly, assertion of IP rights is not something that's supremely uh, 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 frequent, uh, but rather it's used in building relationships with other parties that you deal with. And so to be able to protect it means that it's easier to define and it's easier to transfer or to give access to, to someone else. Hmm. One uh, common IP mistake that people make is to start thinking about IP protection too late. Uh, we often hear that uh, the cost of IP protection can be a hurdle. So how much does it cost to protect IP? I think that's a it's a it's a trick question really because the one of the questions I usually ask my my clients or potential clients is well what's the cost of not protecting what is the lost business opportunity that you have if you just bring your in, innovations to market and then freely let anyone else uh, reproduce what it is that you've created um, and the reality also is that. Um, yes, it, it is costly. Patents are a costly mechanism, um, but the cost of obtaining a patent is often um, a fraction of the cost of actually innovating a product. If, you know, if you're spending two, three years um, on an innovation and research and development, that costs a lot more than the cost of a patent. And so you need to balance these different uh, imperatives and also work extremely closely with your IP advisor, with your um, IP attorney generally, to make sure that they understand what your needs are, what your resources are, and to craft a strategy and an approach that's gonna meet those needs and resources, and yet be able to achieve the business goals. Mm. You're alluding there to my last question. So I know that IP can be com complex and, and it's really important to get it right. So who can help people with IP protection while also keeping an eye on the cost? And I think that's, thank you for that question. I think it's really important for companies to turn to IP professionals, whether they be patent or trademark agents or lawyers that are well-versed in intellectual property, because it is a complex uh, environment, but it can be demystified and it can be decomplexified and your, your trusted IP partner in that conversation is fundamental to understand those business needs, as I mentioned before, and also help you achieve them through the appropriate and, and of course, cost-effective leveraging of the appropriate strategies. Hmm. So we've looked at the various forms of intellectual property that can protect ideas and creations. But to seek protection, it's also important to make sure that you own it since you can't protect what you don't own. And I know it may be tempting to simply assume that the creators of IP are also the owners of this IP. But that's not necessarily true. For example, someone can hire, be hired to create. There are employees, service providers, and other partners that create IP as part of their work. So, Louis-Pierre, where do people need to look to determine ownership of something that they want to protect? So, uh, ownership of intellectual property follows different rules depending on what kind of IP we're looking at. So. In a in a employer employee type relationship, um, when it comes to copyright, for example, or uh, even trademarks and logos and things like that, that usually vests with the employer. Now, in many cases, the employer will have a specific clause in the employment contract that confirms that any material that is created by the employee in the course of business will be owned by the employer. Um, but 
the difficulty arises when we're not in a typical employer employee relationship and when you're dealing with third parties and there uh, things can be a little bit more complex and and in those cases sometimes uh, the ip ownership or the default ip ownership can vest with the person or the creator or the inventor of whatever we're looking at um, and in the absence of a contract then that person remains the the owner and so you can find yourself in situations where if you have not addressed these issues properly then you may have ended up paying for some development or for some creation or for some copyright or even a logo and and you're not actually the owner of the intellectual property that results of that and so it's it's really important to address that issue clearly and upfront. Mm, so I could I could tell that if if a creator uh, realizes that don't have that they don't have the clear contractual terms when they're in the process of seeking eye pre protection, then they there is really no choice but to to try to to um, to face this issue up front. Is that what you're saying? Exactly. I think um, we we often run into situations where you know at the beginning of a collaborative uh, relationship, people are excited, they're anxious to start working together and to to build whatever they're they're coming together to build. And it's only a little bit later on that we start realizing, well, oh, we didn't agree or we didn't talk about the IP issues. And sometimes by that point, uh, the relationship can have soured, or it's not the same people who are uh, on the on both sides of, of the equation and therefore it becomes a lot more complicated to deal with those issues afterwards our mm. recommendation is to always try to address these issues up front make sure that everyone's coming into this relationship with open eyes and full information and understand what the parameters of the relationship are going to be so that there is no question ultimately about who owns what depending on whatever that what might be that is developed in the course of a relationship. Mm, the lesson is don't assume that you own the IP, always have contractual terms to clearly articulate the, the ownership. Uh, and it's a good lesson to, to learn and to integrate now during this webinar, as opposed to have to learn it the hard way in a relationship. Oh, absolutely. So when you can prove the ownership, you can then process to apply for uh, progress to apply for IP protection. And of course, um, another thing to critically assess is the business opportunity. For example, have you verified that your target market exists? Do your customers have other alternatives? What are they? What are the, qu the switching costs? Um, it's also important to critically assess the size of the business opportunity. So can you do a bottom up approach to estimate the market size? Um, so how many units can you sell in a day for each sale? What is your gross and net revenue after all your stakeholders or partners for manufacturing, distribution, marketing, and so on have been paid. You also need to be familiar with the industry dynamics. This means to know your competitors and what they do to maintain their market share. It could be good to know if it's a fragmented market or if there are big players controlling many brands. Also, familiarize yourself with the regulatory gold or de facto standards that may be driving consumer decisions behind the scenes. Also consider the product life cycle. How will you bring the invention or creation to the customer? Plan for, test, and describe how manufacturers, distributors, stockists, retailers, and the customers will be able to manufacture, deal with packaging, shipping, storage, and even disposal of the product, packaging, data, and so on. So it's a really good idea to write a business plan to assess if your idea is commercially viable. The Business Development Bank of Canada provide free templates that are designed to help you set your business on the right track and increase your chances of success. You can open the description to this video for a link to these templates. So it's important to look at the business opportunity and investigate IP rights. Is there a right or a wrong order to do this, Lolita? I don't think there's a right or wrong order. I think um, as any good business person, uh, the decisions you make should probably preferentially be informed by data and solid data. 
and therefore uh, before you embark on a on a significant r and d project for example or before you start you know innovating or collaborating with third parties on uh, innovation or improving a product or a service uh, it might be a really good idea and fairly cost effective to do some some basic searching or some preliminary searching to see well what ip is out there now it's really hard when we talk about copyright issues except if we're in the music or the video industry but in terms of products and services that potentially can be protected by a patent or an industrial design the databases are open to everyone and you can do some basic searching with the Canadian IP Office website, the USPTO website, the European Patent Office website, and your advisor will, or your IP professional will probably have access to uh, paid databases that can further refine and, and do more sophisticated searching. And so I think it's important to do that at the beginning so that you understand what the potential roadblocks or opportunity opportunities i'm sorry may be from an ip perspective yeah and i think an extension of that is um some of the other um, ip that you may be relying on for for your making your product and service well that's another good point right because intellectual property um is is something that you own and that protects you or to the certain extent helps you prevent others from doing what it is that you have protected. But um, in patents, for example, we often say that a patent is a negative right in that it allows you to stop someone else from doing what you've protected, but it doesn't necessarily give you a license to manufacture. And the reason for that is because you may be subject to the rights of others who have obtained IP protection, patents or industrial designs before you and your product or your service may in fact be potentially infringing on those existing IP rights. And therefore, it's, it's really important sometimes, um, if not often, to ensure that you have this freedom to, uh, to manufacture or this freedom to sell before you actually launch your product. No one actually wants to launch a product and then a few weeks later receive a letter from someone who's asserting IP rights much better to have that idea or to have that knowledge ahead of time so you can prepare yourself and perhaps shift your R&D or your development in order to not be infringing. Mm, sounds like a, a good investment. Um, so we've talked about the various forms of IP, the ownership of IP and the importance of assessing both businesses and the IP landscape. We've learned about the importance of having access to all the IP you need to take your idea to market. Now let's talk a little bit about the kind of IP professionals that can assist with this. For example, SIPO has a range of products and services to help creators and inventors to better understand IP. And in addition to our online material, we also have IP advisors that can help identifying various forms of IP and inform creators and owners how these can be protected and used strategically. So this material is meant to help people come prepared to discuss their IP with others. So our IP advisors don't provide legal advice. They don't draft contract or apply for IP rights. That's the kind of work that you and your peers carry out, right, uh, Louis Pia? Exactly. And the slide here shows a distinction between IP lawyers and IP agents. And I think it's important to recognize that in some cases, that will be the same person. I, for example, I am a registered patent agent, but I am, or not but, but and I am also a lawyer. And so I can, I can provide the entire range of services um, and many others in the profession can as well. But the, the distinction that the slide makes here is that um, when we talk about IP strategy or crafting an IP strategy or rolling out this IP strategy, then both an IP lawyer and an IP agent and, and the IP advisors at SIPO can, can you know, do some of the work. When it comes to obtaining IP protection, 
then your agent, the person who will actually draft the application or file the trademark application or design application will be assisting you with that. And of course, both agents and lawyers will be crucial in assisting you in drafting and negotiating contracts. Now, you will need a lawyer for that, um, but the agents are also involved in those negotiations to help clarify and understand properly what the intellectual property that is going to be the subject of the license is. And of course, when it comes to IP enforcement, when we're talking about litigation or assertion of your IP rights against a third party, then you will need to turn to an IP lawyer. Um, and I would, I would suggest also that um, you, know, you take some time and do some research to be able to identify those persons with whom you can have a trusted business relationship because your IP advisor or your IP uh, professional um, will be an integral part of your business for hopefully a long time. And therefore you need to have you know, a good sense of, of, of a common vision, common understanding of what your needs are to be able to, to build this long-term long relationship. Thanks for explaining the differences there. That's uh, really important information for especially those new to IP as, as this, there's many people that can provide various assistance with IP. Um, this concludes the first segment where we've looked at how, what to investigate if you can take your idea to the market. Next, we'll look at different ways to enter the market. So another aspect of taking your idea to market is to think about who else you want or need to work with to make it happen. And of course, there's no one size fits all model, but here are some of the common ways to enter the market. Uh, many entrepreneurs do everything themselves. They may work with IP professionals to protect their IP, but the main part of making and selling the product or services is something that they manage alone. But protecting your IP is also the gateway into other models where you will need to share it with others. Louis Pierre will talk about the importance of identifying IP when you will be sharing activities with someone else in partnering or co collaborations. IP is also the basis for letting someone else do all or some of the work through licensing agreement, including franchising. And finally, another way to monetize your IP is through selling it to someone else. Now, taking an idea to market often includes doing additional research and development and then consider one or combinations of these models. It also, uh, or it may also include doing business abroad. So I'd like to take a step back and mention some of the government organizations that can offer valuable help. We have links to all of these in the description of this video. Innovation Canada offers funding and expert advice to drive new collaborations. Here you can explore existing government owned IP and use their business benefit finder to get a tailored list of everything government can do for your business. We have also mentioned Business Development Bank of Canada and their free templates you can use for business planning. Another Crown organization is the Export Development Canada. They are dedicated to helping Canadian companies of all sizes succeed on the world stage, equip them with the tools they need, such as trade knowledge, financing solutions, equity, insurance, and connections. The Trade Commissioner Service can help Canadian business grow by connecting them with funding and support programs, international opportunities through a network of Trade Commissioners in over 160 cities worldwide. Now, let's focus on the ways to take your idea to the market, starting off by looking at IP and partnering. Louis Pierre, both small and large organizations can benefit from collaborations. What are some of the things small companies should consider when it comes to partnering? Well, I think partnering is the crystallization of your of your innovation efforts in the sense that you realize that uh, you may not be able to do everything all on your own, and you may need assistance uh, for part or maybe that's a small or a large part of of your business development efforts. And uh, like partnering is this this pooling of the resources together in order to achieve a common goal. Um, and this can be done through a variety of different, uh, of different mechanisms, such as a, a partnership, a joint venture. Uh, it could be a grant receiving organization that uh, comes and helps you with your, uh, with your 
uh, your efforts. And, and but the uh, the important thing is that IP rights are crucial at every point in these types of transactions because they will help define what the scope of the collaboration is in terms of who brings what to the table and what we are going to work on to create something. Um, and also it will help understand what the party's rights and obligations are when they are collaborating together and when something new comes out of this collaboration and becomes therefore potentially protectable by one or more of the various um, IP rights protections mechanisms. Mm. Uh, next, we'll look at licensing IP rights. How would you explain that to someone who's completely new to this, uh, Luigi? Yeah. So licensing, I, I often uh, try to uh, uh, show that licensing is like renting an apartment in the sense that you have access to uh, a physical space, you have access to uh, an area, uh, you pay rent on it, but you don't actually own it. And so you can't do whatever you want with it because someone else actually owns it. And licensing intellectual property is a little bit like that. Uh, in exchange for what we typically call a royalty or a royalty rate, you will have access to part of that intellectual property. And you will be able to do with that intellectual property whatever the license agreement allows you to do. It may be manufacturing, it may be distributing, it may be importing, it may be doing a whole bunch of different things that are covered within this license agreement. And it can also be limited geographically or not, depending on the license terms. And so the, the boundaries of, of a license will include, you know, the, the products, the goods, the services, where this license applies, um, is there a specific use or purpose for the license, for how long, and of course, all of these activities are going to be subject to um, the payment of a royalty and ongoing license fees, as well as potentially an upfront fee, but especially quality control requirements. The licensor will grant you these IP rights as long as you meet uh, or exceed certain requirements when it comes to the quality of the products and services that are the, uh, the subject of the license rights. Hmm. That's a good way to explain it. Uh, now, there are parts um, or a certain point may, where it may make sense to actually permanent part from your IP. So yes. if we say that licensing is like renting intellectual property, assigning intellectual property would be like selling. So the asset will have a new owner. What, what are the key considerations when you do this? Yeah. Exactly, exactly. That That's the, the perfect um, comparison. And the key considerations why one would like to uh, sell a part of their IP is because they've uh, it's no longer a core focus of their business objectives, or it is a, a division or a part of the business that doesn't necessarily bring as much um, income in, um, or the business doesn't have the, the, uh, the skill force, the, the, the labor force, the, the skilled workers to bring this particular line of product or services to market the way it should be. And, and so in cases like that, someone will decide to outright sell their intellectual property to someone else. Um, the important, very important aspect of a sale is that the person who sells retains no ownership in the intellectual property once it's sold. There can be, in some cases, a license back to some rights to continue using uh, for research purposes or some other types of purposes, but you really surrender entire control to the intellectual property to a third party, and then they can do you know, what they want with it. It's like selling a house, right? When, you, when you've moved out of the house and given the keys to the new owner, you can't come back and start repainting rooms. Mm. And I guess, um... These can be quite significant deals and, and anyone thinking about partnering, collaborating, licensing, or even selling their IP should probably do some research to make informed decision. Um, and this is what we call 
due diligence, which is basically learning about your potential business partners, uh, their, their goals and IP and business interest, because this can help all parties agree on a deal that will be useful for everyone. So we're going to look at some of the information that is good to have at hand to make informed decisions. We tell, um, what are the things that you would look into before a deal? Well, I think the, the first thing that needs to be done is understand what the purpose of the deal is. So what, what are we entering into this negotiation for? Once we've answered that question, then we can start tailoring or researching or identifying the, ad, the IP assets that need to form part of this deal whether it be uh, patents or trademarks or copyrights. Um, and part of the due diligence is to ensure that uh, whatever those IP rights might be, that the parties who are coming to the table to negotiate this actually have the rights to the IP that they allege is part of the deal. Um, and it's not uncommon for uh, due diligence matters to reveal that there might be some issues in the chain of title for some patents or for some trademarks or some copyright material. And therefore that needs to be fixed before the deal can be further completed. Um, one of the tangential questions to this is of course the valuation, the value of the intellectual property that's being transferred and how much each party is willing to attach a number to that, to that value. And considerations of, well, where does your IP fit into the other person's business plan? Is it something that's core fundamental? In a case like that, uh, perhaps they attach a higher value to the intellectual property that you own. Or is it something that is still um, perhaps not quite mature in terms of technology advancement? There's still a lot of work that needs to be done from an R&D perspective, from a manufacturing or manufacturability perspective, um, and therefore the value of the intellectual property, while not, not significant, uh, will be much lower than in a different context. Um, and that ties in also to the question of, well, how critical is the IP that you're bringing to the table to the success of the other person's objectives? Um, again, all of those issues need to be looked at fairly carefully um, and, and understood as well before you, we start negotiating a contract to uh, license or sell intellectual property to a third party. Yes. Um, so now we've talked about the different ways to take your idea to market. Uh, we know about the importance of transforming the idea into intellectual property and who can help protecting my idea as an intellectual property. Uh, we've discussed some of the government resources that are available. And here we've also talked about um, having to find your IP as it is the starting point to market entry models like partnering or licensing as well as selling your IP to someone else. Um, Next, we're going to take a look at some of the skills needed to take your idea to the market. Uh, because bringing an idea to the market is far from just intellectual property. Creators and inventors are often the ones most familiar with the actual IP, its limitations, the stage of development, potential improvements, and how to man manufacture it, and so on. It's also necessary to consider IP in the light of business and marketing and, and those contexts to select a partner and deal that brings value to all the parties. Louis, yeah, can you talk about the, the value of an IP professional and, and how to bring all these skills together? Yeah, and I, I thank you. And I think that's an important aspect because, um, you know, especially when we talk about uh, SMEs or startups, uh, um, sometimes the creators, the inventors, uh, business marketing and IP management are all going to be essentially the same person or a very tightly knit group of people. And the, the IP professional can, can help make the distinctions between the various roles and the competing interests that the various roles will have. Uh, for example, the creators and the inventors will um, rightly treat the invention or the intellectual property that they've created as, as, as their own, as their, their baby, so to speak. Um, and therefore they will have vested interests in ensuring that it works properly, um, that it is, of course, uh, something that meets the needs of a market. Um, but then 
uh, business and marketing will come in to uh, sort of perhaps temper some of those passions from time to time, but also understand who are the right partners. And the right partner for a deal or for a collaboration may surprisingly not be the person that you would initially think of. And it's, it's important to have some flexibility in thought and some openness also to understand that, um, you know, the, the person that you've been doing business with over the past 10, 5, 10, 15 years um, may or may not be the best potential partner for this particular aspect of your business. And finding someone else who can bring more value to the table might be a far more interesting um, avenue to, to undertake. The, the other, I think, also very important aspect is that of IP management. And, you know, IP management has really, uh, in a context of, of sharing and collaboration, has really two separate uh, objectives. The first one, um, especially when we talk about inventions and trade secrets um, and, and know-how, the, the, the focus is on trying to keep control over the information and to try to ensure that there is no leakage of information inadvertent or uh, or deliberate. So for example, if we're talking about inventions, everything needs to be kept confidential before a first filing of an application is made. Um, Know-how and trade secrets obviously need to be kept secret at all times, otherwise they lose their, their protection because of the nature of the secret or the confidential information. When we talk about IP management, in a collaborative context, then it requires a completely different skill set in that you're trying to, in fact, open up the business to collaboration and to sharing that intellectual property with third parties, but always within the required contractual agreements that maintain and preserve the confidentiality of information that may be exchanged, uh, recognizes and um, and underlines the trade secrets that may be accessed by the other person. And of course, um, you know, when we talk about enforcement, then also that requires a, a different mindset. And the, the IP professional plays a key role in bridging these various competing interests together and maintaining focus on what the ultimate business objective of the company is. Because all of this, all of the conversation we've had today um, is premised on the fact that the IP strategy needs to be fully aligned with the business strategy. If it is not, there's a significant disconnect and it's going to be the cause of frustration and, and uh, insatisfaction from all over the place. And therefore, you know, the IP professional is able to look at the IP landscape the, the IP that the company has or the business has and make sure that all of that is being aligned with the business objectives so that the uh, limited resources that the companies have are used as efficiently as possible. Thank you. That, there's many things to, to keep in mind and I can definitely see how uh, in smaller companies uh, many people would need to, to wear all of these hats or maybe get someone to help them wear some of these hats. Yes, and, and, and I think that's important to be able to realize that, you know, as much as I, I value the entrepreneurial spirit um, that, is, that is vibrant, I know every day that I meet uh, potential business uh, people, um, there is sometimes the realization that you do need to have help from a third party, um, a trusted advisor, um, and, you know, it could be for financing, it could be for market development, it could be for marketing, but it also has to be, I think, for intellectual property issues uh, because of the complexity we've alluded to, because of the amount of rights that are currently present on the market and to be able to navigate through those rights. Um, it's, I think, important to have someone at your side that can help you as much as possible. 
That's great. Um, so that really concludes the webinar that we have on, on taking your ideas to market. I think uh, if I was an entrepreneur, I'll probably print that list of skills and keep it next to me so that I would know what, which hat to wear and, and where do I need help. Um, I'll take you through a quick summary of what you have learned at this webinar. Uh, you have learned how to investigate if you can take the idea to market. We've gone through some of the sources that can help you do so. We've seen the many types of IP that an idea can take um, in order to be commercialized. You know what that you can't protect what you don't own uh, because creators and owners of IP aren't always the same people. So investigate and get a paper trail of your ownership. You know where to find templates and how to assess the market potential of your idea and that you should make sure that you have the IP rights you need, including third party rights to take your idea to market. We've also discussed the ways to take your idea to the market through partnering, licensing, assigning, or even selling the IP. We talked about uh, some of the due diligence, so your preparatory research to make informed decisions that would bring value to all parties. And finally, we talked about the skills to take your idea to market. We talked about the creators, inventors, and how they understand the IP's capabilities the business and marketing skills to understand the financial opportunity. And of course, LP, uh, Louis Pierre, you spoke to great lengths of, of uh, the importance of IP management and an IP professional to have and do the necessary paperwork that needs to be in place to address any legal um, issues. Um, this presentation has been brought to you by the Canadian Intellectual Property Office in collaboration with Intellectual Property Institute of Canada. For more information about IP, you can visit www.canada.ca slash IP dash four dash business. To find an IP professional, you can visit www.ipic.ca. Louis Pierre, it has been a pleasure. Thank you for co-presenting. Thank you very much, Lisa. This has been a great pleasure and I hope this webinar has been useful and uh, will serve as the basis for even more innovation and uh, perhaps uh, uh, enhanced, li enhanced licensing activity in Canada. Thank you. Thank you.